Let's welcome Pastor Shen to come along. Hallelujah. Let's welcome him. sends him on this errand 
to his brothers. His brothers were, you know, his other ten brothers, his older brothers, were looking after the sheep. And uh, if you've ever been over in the Middle East, uh, they still do that today. You know, the, the people in there, they, they go around and, and keep their sheep, yeah. you know, take them around. And it's all very desolate sort of country, and um, they sort of have to keep them moving to find food. And, and so it took him several days to, to find his brothers. It was quite a quite a mission for him to go out and, and he went to one place and they weren't there, he went to somewhere else and they weren't there and he finally caught up with them in uh, I know, Gothan, I think it was, where he finally caught up with them. And um, even though Joseph, you know, it's interesting that Joseph was at home with his father, even though he was 17, he would have been of an age where he could have been out there working with his brothers, but... You know, for some reason he was at home and his father sent him out. So can you imagine, you know, you could just imagine that his brothers already didn't like him and then they're out there, you know, they're not in the nice comfortable home. They're out there in the, you know, in the wilds of the wilderness looking after the sheep and you can imagine when they when they see him coming they say, oh yeah, that'd be right, Joseph. You know, you know, he gets all the privileges. He gets to stay at home. We have to work out here. And, and you know, it wasn't like they just um, lived in a house and then went to work during the day and then went back to their house. They were living in tents, yes. you know, they were living pretty rough. They had to, you know, whatever they, they had to sort of go and find water and food to, to feed themselves. It was, it was a very, uh, you know, it's quite a hard life uh, living out in the, in the desert looking after sheep. So you can imagine what their reaction was when they saw Joseph coming. And, uh, you know, when we read in the story, we're not going to read it all now, but, um, you know, they... They kind of, um, they, 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 they see him coming and they somehow or other decide to, that, that they want to kill him. You know, and they, at first they want to kill him and then uh, I think, uh, who, what was his brother that told them, no, no, um, you know, was, was it the eldest one that said, no, no, we, I can't remember his name now, but, uh, uh, yeah, but anyway, doesn't matter, but they, they, they were going to kill him, then they said, no, no. Let's let's put him in the in this pit, and uh, and we'll, we'll put him and, and hide him away. And his brother was going to come and rescue him later. But um, and then along came these uh, slave traders, and uh, and they had this brilliant idea. Oh, we got Joseph in the pit. They basically left him there to die. But um, these slave traders came along, and I said, Oh, I know we could make some money, and we could you know sell him to these slave traders, and and uh, you know you could just imagine what Joseph would have been feeling when they put him in the pit. He was there to die, wasn't he? They, yes. uh, he knew that he that that, that they would they had put him there. It wasn't a good reason. They didn't put him there because they loved him, and uh, he knew that he was in trouble. But um, you know, he, they they uh, stripped him naked. You know, they, they, he was almost you know they, they took his cloak away from him, and you know they they used that to take back to his father to, to say, oh, you know, he was you know he was killed in the desert or whatever, and. Um, and, you know, so he would have been pretty, uh, I would imagine, afraid, alone, confused, didn't know what, why he was in this position. And, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, you just, you can imagine yourself being in that position. Um, and, and yet, we, uh, you know, he, he managed to hang on. He didn't give up, did he? And so then he went. To, he got in with the slave traders, and they they took him to to Egypt, and uh, you know, probably to their capital, which now is Cairo. But somewhere they took him somewhere to where the, all of the you know the trade was happening, where where people would buy their slaves. And when you look at the map of where they were and where they ended up, but that's quite a long journey. It was probably about a month's journey uh, at least, depending on how often they stopped and so on. And um, and yeah, so he he got taken to the to the markets, and um, you know again you could just imagine um, on that trip on that journey he sort of got rescued from the pit, but now he's being taken to be sold into slavery, and uh, you know just imagine if you were if you were Joseph, what would you be thinking? Would you be rejoicing and praising the Lord, or would you be saying, "Oh, those rotten brothers of mine," you know, you know? Would, they, would you be complaining to God, saying, "God, what have you done? To, what have I done to you?" You know, um, you know, maybe, maybe you were kind of assuming the worst that you would uh, end up with some, uh, you know, horrible uh, master that would would treat you poorly. Um, but you know, there'd be a lot of things going through your mind, wouldn't there, when you um, on on that journey? 
So I've just got to find them. I've just dumped my <laughs> notes. <laughs> And, you know, you can imagine when Joseph arrived into the marketplace to be sold that he wouldn't have been in a very good condition, you know, in being, um, you know, the, I'm sure the slave traders wouldn't have looked after him very well. You can imagine that it would have been easy for him to be quite, you know, depressed and, and not really um, presenting himself very well. But when we read, when we pick up this story in Genesis 39, uh, we read some interesting things. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. So this uh, Potiphar was quite an important person and uh, he would have been looking for good quality slaves. You know, he wouldn't have been, he would have had quite, um, uh, you know, would be quite wealthy and so he could have afforded to, to pay for, for the best that, that was there. So rather than Joseph coming and being all depressed and, and you know, not presenting the best, he, he obviously did appear to be the best to Potiphar and, uh, and he was able to, to, to purchase him as a slave. And you know, so that's the first thing we learn about Joseph, that, that he, he really didn't give up. You know, he, sort of, uh, he, was, he was able to um, be, have the appearance of somebody who was you know, worthwhile having. And, um, and he, so he went to, to Potiphar's house and we pick up and we continue the story. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favour in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So, yeah, this is amazing that this... Joseph, who's been ripped out of his home and, and taken to a completely another culture and uh, being made a slave before he was a free man, you know, he was the favourite son and uh, with all the privileges that came with that and he became a slave and yet he was able to um, present to the people that were over him uh, this attitude of, you know, I'm willing to work, I'm willing to do the right thing and... Um, and you know, be a, a, a somebody that was uh, that they promoted fairly quickly. So you just wonder what what was it about Joseph that um, that that brought him to these people's attention first to Potiphar and then to uh, to the you know to the the manager of the household to be able to um, promote him in such a way. Well, we read in um, you know we we read in those verses before that the Lord was with Joseph. And, uh, you know, I think that's the key thing. If we want to be, um, uh, if we want to succeed in life, we need to recognise that God is with us and that, uh, that God is there by our side and, uh, and to stay close to Him. You know, God is always there, but we're not always making ourselves conscious that He's there. We kind of get distracted by things, don't we? And, and we move away from God. And, and, uh, but Joseph didn't do that. He stayed uh, close to God. And we read in Acts 17 that, um, you know, the, uh, uh, that we should seek God and uh, feel our, you know, this is Paul's speech to the men of Athens. Uh, you know, he's telling them you should seek God and feel your way towards Him. And find him. Uh, and it's not that hard to do because he is actually not far from each one of us. You know, so that's the first key in Joseph's life is to, uh, to stay close to God, to understand that God is there and to stay close to him. And, uh, you know, the second thing is that he not only sought God, but he let everybody know that the Lord was with him. You know, people were able to see there was something different about Joseph because of the way he just conducted his life and you know he kind of even though he was you know in these terrible situations he was able to uh, let people know that he trusted God and um, in 1 Peter he tells us to honour Christ the Lord as holy because uh, and always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason that, that there is hope in you you know and so Joseph obviously had that that hopefulness about him. He was different to the people around him. And, uh, and you know, so even when we're in the pits 
as it were. Now, Joseph was in the pit to start with, and then in slavery, and you know, uh, he was able to say, No, God is with me. I trust in the Lord, and, and, and actually be so convinced of that that people could see that in him. So that's the first thing, is trust God even when you're in the pits. But uh, then we know that uh, in that, um, you know, Joseph was only a young man. He started off at 17, and so he was only maybe in his young 20s. And I presume he was quite good looking because uh, Potiphar's wife got, it, got her eyes on him and she tried to seduce him several times. And uh, finally she got him into the house all alone. There was no one there. And uh, she tricked him to come close to her and then she kind of, you know, tried to embrace him and he kind of ran for his life. And in the process she, you know, grabbed his coat and, uh, you know, she sort of then cried rape and, you know, that, that she uh, and, and got him into all sorts of troubles, you know, showed his cloak as evidence, you know, and said, look what he's done. And uh, so he got thrown back into prison. <laughs> And uh, you can imagine what Joseph would have been feeling like. You know, like, I've done the right thing. I've, 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 I've not, you know, like he was in a very privileged position in that household. And, uh, you know, he could have, um, you know, done naughty things with, with Potiphar's wife and probably got away with it, yeah. you know, because he was in charge. He probably could have organised things and, you know, but, and, and he probably could have said, well, you know, this is, I've got to do this to protect my position, and you know he, he possibly could have got away with it. But he said, "No, no, I, you know, I, I trust in the Lord, and, and and this is not right." So you know he he ran away, and and as a result, got put back into prison because obviously Potiphar didn't believe him and didn't even ask what happened. He just just straight away assumed that his wife, uh, you know, was telling the truth, and um, you know he he could have cheated on his master, but he didn't. And um, you just imagine. Uh, how Joseph would have felt, you know, at that moment when, you know, he'd sort of started to feel, look, you know, I trust in God and look what happens. God looks after me and then this happens. You know, he gets wrongly accused and persecuted. You know, he would have, I could imagine saying, oh, it's not fair. You know, God, you've abandoned me and, you know, look what's happened. I'm innocent, you know. But uh, no, um, we read that's not the case. In Genesis 29, uh, 21, he says, The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. You know, so even though Joseph would have found every right to feel abandoned and unloved by God, he obviously maintained his trust in God and God uh, showed him. But you wonder how did he do that? Well, first of all, um, he uh, you know, talks about uh, that God showed Joseph his steadfast love. And uh, do you know that the, the reference to steadfast love appears 398 times in the Bible. You know, isn't that amazing that God's steadfast love is just strewn throughout the Bible? I wonder if anyone has a favourite, you know, steadfast love verse. Can anyone quote a verse that talks about God's steadfast love? I've got one if you don't, but <laughs> I can't remember out of all. There's 193 verses that reference God's steadfast love. And my favourite one is Lamentations 3.22. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Can anyone finish it? His mercies endure and and forever or never come to an end. Yeah, so, uh, and that's, but there's, you know, there's 192 other verses that talk about God's steadfast love. And, uh, you know, so that's the first thing. That, that the reason that Joseph was able to, um, you know, stand firm, took hold of that steadfast love. He said, well, even though, I'm being thrown back into prison. I'm not going to let go of God's steadfast love. And uh, the second reason was that not only did he rely on God's love, but he obviously uh, was shining that love to those around him. You know, straight away, the, the prison, uh, the, the guy in charge of the prison recognised that there was something different about Joseph and that he could be trusted. And uh, he put him in charge of everything that happened in the prison. And, uh, you know, we read in Matthew... Chapter 5, verse 16, 
that Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Isn't that good? That uh, God's steadfast love is in us. And if we show that love to others, they will see God as well. And, uh, you know, Joseph took a hold of that. He knew that. And, uh, you know, it's obvious by what happened. So, first of all, Joseph was in the pits. Then he was persecuted. But he, he stayed true. And, uh, and then, so you can imagine, you know, he was down... And then he was up, you know, well, he started off as up, wasn't he, when he was, with, with, he was the favourite son. So he was up, and then he was down, and then he was up in, in Potiphar's house, and then he's down in prison, and then he got elevated again in prison. And while he was in prison, uh, there's two guys at Pharaoh's house, you know, Pharaoh's um, palace sort of came, got put in prison. There was the cupbearer and the baker, and uh, they both have dreams while they're in prison, and, and Joseph is able to interpret these dreams. And um, he actually asked the cupbearer, um, can you remember me to Pharaoh? You know, because the dream was about the cupbearer being, you know, put in prison but then being restored. And yeah. so he said, can you, can you remember me to Pharaoh? And you would think that that would be a very significant thing, you know, like somebody in prison telling you what's going to happen. And then for that thing to happen, you'd think, well, yeah, sure, he would remember that. But no, the cupbearer just completely forgot. He just only thought about himself and uh, completely forgot about Joseph. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine what it would have been like, you know, after the cupbearer got taken out of you know, prison and put back into Pharaoh's household, he would have thought, any day now, any day, they're going to come and you know, talk to me. But you know, day after day, month after month, and finally year after year, for two years he was there and, um, and nothing. And then... Pharaoh has this dream, he has a number of dreams, and nobody could tell him, all of his wise people, none of them could tell him what this dream meant. And then finally, the cupbearer remembers Joseph, two years later. And um, you can just imagine, how would Joseph feel? You know, I can imagine saying, well, you know, blow you, cupbearer, you know, you forgot me for two years, I'm not going to come and help you, you know, forget it, you know. <laughs> you didn't do the right thing, but no, no, he, he brought, you know, what, Cleaned himself up, had a shave, got dressed, and and came to Pharaoh. And uh, you know, um, it's uh, just uh, incredible that, that Joseph just straight away just responded, and he knew that there were, he just knew that this was an opportunity, and uh, he had uh, complete faith in God. Uh, he says that. Um, uh, yeah, so in, in Genesis 41, we pick up the story. Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favourable answer. So isn't that great that Joseph... Uh, trusted God, even though he was he'd been disappointed, he was still had his faith and trust in God. That he went boldly before Pharaoh, knowing that God would provide an answer. And uh, so he uh, he does that, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And you know, you could just imagine, like Pharaoh is is a very powerful figure in Egypt. He's the most powerful. You know, they actually treat Pharaoh as a god. You know, when you go over there and you look at all the, you know, all of the things to see, they're all about elevating Pharaoh as a god. You know, all of the, the you know, the um, the Valley of the Kings, all their tombs and and uh, you know, in their in their um, temples and so on. It's all about uh, placing Pharaoh as god. And so Joseph was going before this, you know, effectively a god in their culture, and. Uh, you can imagine if he gets it wrong, the Pharaoh could easily just say, right, well, that, take him out and, and kill him, you know, because he was only a Hebrew. Um, there'd be no reason for him to, uh, uh, you know, if he wasn't able to deliver. And uh, you can imagine, you know, it would be a normal reaction for Joseph just to be thinking, well, what if I fail? Um, what if I'm rejected again? You know, what if Pharaoh doesn't like what I say? Um, and yet uh, he, he didn't... Um, you know, he didn't falter at any time. He just said, you know, um, 
God will provide the answer. He was completely confident that God will provide the answer. And, um, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 17 and verse 20, Truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So Joseph had that faith, didn't he, that he was able to go to Pharaoh and say, Yeah, yeah, I, I have complete faith that God will come through. And, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible. But he, he didn't only have faith in God. He had a, a, a humble dependence in God, didn't he? He didn't say, yes, yes, I'm this great big dream interpreter and I can do this. He said, no, no, God will do this. Yes. And he straight away gives glory and honour to God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we see that in, um, you know, like... It, and again, when you go over to Egypt and you see the just the um, you know they had so much that there was so much belief in in uh, you know all of these you know spiritual things and and you know that the, the wise men they, they held them up as you know as being very powerful people you know and so Joseph could have used that and you know he could have positioned himself as this powerful person. Uh, and yet he didn't. He just said, "No, no, it's not me. It's nothing to do with me. It's God." You know, and uh, and, and so he, he had this. He was expressing this humble dependence on God. And uh, you know, it's just the same thing that Jesus commands in John 15 verse five. He says, "I am the vine; you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." And, you know, that's the thing that we've got to, you know, that Joseph knew and understood, that apart from God, he couldn't do anything. He was nothing. But with God, he was able to boldly stand before Pharaoh and say, yes, I can, I can interpret these dreams because God is on my side. You know, that uh, we heard a, a, someone say that um, you plus God is a majority in any situation. Isn't that good? You know, no matter what the situation, you plus God is the majority. And, uh, you know, we can uh, be... And when we're dependent on God, not relying on ourselves, we can be confident of what's going to happen. So, so Joseph trusted in God even in the pits. He trusted in God even uh, even when he was um, uh, disappointed. You know, he trusted in God even when he was persecuted. And uh, you know, when we read the the story after those events, after Joseph interpreted those gene, dreams for Pharaoh. Um, he that things really started to change for him. You know, by the time he was 30, uh, he was appointed as Pharaoh's second in charge, wasn't he? Yes. He, he was only second to, to Pharaoh. Uh, he gets married to an Egyptian woman, has a couple of sons. Um, you know, the, the dreams, if you remember, were seven bountiful years and then seven years of famine. Mm -hmm. And so in those seven years, he presided over really bountiful times, you know, and and we see that in our own history, don't we? When there, there are times when they're really good times, and then often they're followed by times that are really bad times. And uh, you know, we see that multiple times happening over history, where there's a period of, uh, of really good times, and then there's a period of bad times. And and Joseph knew that these were coming, you know, and and he he was wise with those bountiful years. Um, you know, during his forties, uh, he finally gets reunited with his family. So all of that time, from the time he was 17 till the time he reached his 40s, sometime, I don't know exactly when, but sometime in his 40s. You know, so that's, uh, what, 20, more than 23 years. He hadn't seen his family at all. And uh, he gets reunited with them. Um, you know, he, he virtually, when you read the story, he acquires for Pharaoh virtually all the wealth in the land during those, those tough years. You know, he sells all of the stores that he kept during the, the good years and he sells them and he basically acquires all the cattle and all the wealth and all the grain you know, from everybody that uh, so that they could continue to live you know so so he actually increased the wealth of the Pharaoh uh, amazingly in that time so he was a very powerful guy and you know by his 50s he was really at the top you know that he had almost absolute power didn't he? Like, there was only one other person who could overrule him, and that was Pharaoh. And he carried a lot of power. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard the saying that um, power corrupts, 
and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, you know, it's a saying that people, when they get too much power, they end up just, you know, completely selling out. But that's not the case with Joseph. You know, he didn't, um, even when we had it all, you know, when we read his uh, story, um, you know, he, uh, you know, he, he had, they even held a state funeral for his father. And, like, it was a huge deal. Uh, there must have cost millions and millions of dollars, you know, to hold this funeral because, you know, they had the, the, the funeral in Egypt and then they processed all the way to, uh, to the resting place of Abraham, you know, which is quite a long journey, you know, it, it's, and, and they, it was a big deal that they, they did this for, for uh, Joseph's father. But, um, you know, so he was right at the top of his game. And um, it was when his father died and his, um, uh, his brothers finally realised that, uh, that his brother was, uh, that the father had died, that Joseph might actually seek vengeance on them. It finally dawned on them that they, he might seek vengeance. So, um, you know, he, uh, they, they, were, they, they ended up asking for forgiveness, begging for forgiveness, and... Uh, and uh, offering to be his slaves. But look what Joseph does. He says, um, Do not fear, for I am in, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph had this opportunity to put his brothers into slavery. He said, no, 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 you know, who am I? You know, I, I'm not God, I can't do that. And, uh, and so, you know, he, he continues to, even though he's at the top of his game, he continues to trust in God. And, uh, you know, so that the first thing he does is to refuse to play God, even though he was in this powerful position. And uh, we read in Romans... He says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. You know, so he stayed humble, didn't he? He didn't position himself above God. He stayed humble. And um, you know, he, uh, he was able to be gracious. And, um, and the second thing he did was to realise that there was more. You know, he knew that God would one day pass judgment. He didn't need to judge anybody because he knew that one day God would pass judgment. He, re he understood that God is there for the whole of our life and beyond. You know, from generation to generation, isn't he? God is there. And he understood that. He didn't have to worry about the now because he understood that God w would look after the, the future. He saw that God had a much bigger plan and was playing a much longer game than anyone could have imagined. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we read that uh, in, in 2 Peter, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, mm -hmm. as some count slowness, but it is patient towards you, not wishing that you sh any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, so Joseph knew that, uh, that God, even though, you know, he promised all these things, that, uh, that God would come through one day with his promises. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, Joseph, uh, you know, he lived a full and abundant life. He survived to see three generations, uh, you know, so of descendants. He had his sons and his sons' sons and his sons' sons' sons. And, um, you know, you just wonder how often would he have reflected on his life. You know, he stayed at the top, didn't he, all through his life. He stayed, he maintained the respect of all the, of Egyptians and Pharaoh, um, you know, and just wonder how often he would have reflected back to those dark, dark days when he was 17 and put in the pit and then sold into slavery and then persecuted and accused wrongly and, and uh, you know, given, treated poorly. But, um, you know, he, he just stayed true to God through all his days. And, uh, and he didn't, you know, when you read the story of Joseph, there was none of this trying to make things happen. He just trusted in God all the way through. And... Um, you know, you don't see any 
um, proudness or conceit or, or you know, becoming uh, all of the power corrupting him. He just stayed humble. Um, he didn't become pompous. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he could have... Um, he could have relinquished his his heritage, couldn't he? He, he, had, he had married a Hebrew wife, a, an Egyptian wife, he had Egyptian children. He was he was the uh, you know the, the top of the the Egyptian sort of hierarchy in terms of uh, power, but he didn't relinquish this uh, his heritage because he says in um, in Genesis 50, Joseph just before he's about to die, he says, "I'm about to die, but God." will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So he died and was buried in Egypt. But uh, he knew that one day, he thought maybe it was in a few years' time, but... It ended up being 400 years before they left Egypt, before the Israelites left Egypt. But he knew that one day that God would call them out. And he said, "When promise me when God calls you out to take my bones and place them in the resting place of Abraham, our father. And, um, you know, so he, he uh, didn't um, ever, ever lose faith in God. You know, he never lost faith in the promise that God had given Abraham and then uh, Isaac and then Jacob, who became Israel. You know, he never forgot the promise of God that you would be a nation that would bless the rest of the world. And, you know, he held on to God's promises. Like, uh, like Jesus says in John 14, uh, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And that's a great promise that we can hold on to, isn't it? That, that, uh, that, God, uh, that, that Jesus, God has a place for us. You know, and that no matter what happens to us, even when we're in the pits, even when we're being persecuted, even when we're being wrongly accused or mm. things aren't going right for us, we can hang on to that promise yes. that one day we're going to be with God Amen. in heaven yes. forever. Amen? Yes. And, uh, you know, so we can hold on to that promise. You know, um, he knew that, the, that his people were sojourners, that they weren't, that, and, and, you know, that they weren't belonging to Egypt. And we're like that, aren't we? We're in the world. We don't belong to the world. We're in the world. Yeah. You know, Joseph was in Egypt. He was being blessed by Egypt, but he knew he didn't belong to Egypt. He belonged to God. And uh, that's the same for us, that, um, you know, that, that we hold on to that promise that we're not here um, to become part of the world. We're here to show the world what yeah. Jesus can do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to me... Joseph was just like his jewel of godly living in a sea of impatient and self-servant living. When you look at all of the other things that other people did and, and the kings that came later, the things that they did, Joseph sort of stands alone as the one who, who never really gave up, ever. You know, he always trusted in God. And, uh, you know, I think he gives us a really great model for how we should live our lives from beginning to end. You know, that uh, recognising that it's not us, that it's God that is with us. Um, trusting God, whether we're in the pit or whether we're being persecuted. Um, giving God glory, whether we're being disappointed or whether we're living in abundance, that we give glory to God for what we have. And, uh, and always holding faith in God's promise. Even when they seem a long way off. You know, and you understand Joseph was talking about a promise that would happen in 400 years' time. But he knew that one day it would happen. Mm -hmm. Even though it was centuries and centuries later, he never lost faith in the, mm -hmm. in the promises of God. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. you know, whether we're in that hot or dusty pit of darkness or at the height of success and blessing, uh, the most important thing that, uh, is that we're always aware of and acknowledge that God is present with us yeah. and that He is completely trustworthy mm -hmm. to fulfil His promises. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Praise God. Praise Thank God. you. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. All right. We're heading over to Truly Now. Or... <laughs> Thank you. Get
analogy of the whole story, we as Indonesia or can be what happens to our people. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, let's thank uh, Pastor Shane again. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Pastor Shane. That was awesome message. We are so blessed by the story of Joseph, isn't it? Excellent. Joseph is, you know, definitely a role model for us, isn't it? Yeah. He, he probably won't be able to do it like him. <laughs> but I know, yes, we have to learn, isn't it? To learn, just become like him, you know, so that we can bring people to God and meet God, which is, that's what is. Um, will. Amen. Praise God. Thank you again, Pastor Shane. We are so blessed and the, the word is awesome tonight and I know that God is, is present here with us and He is listening what has been, you know, what has been preaching tonight. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And um, yeah, we'll, we will continue uh, to, um, what do you call it? Um, the fellowship after mm -hmm. this, and uh, we just uh, sing um, uh, the song that will close the prayer, prayer closing, and um, we, we sing the same song, which is, um, He was nailed to the cross, and then I would like to invite Pastor Shane to close us in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. He was nailed
for them as well. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you will uh, you will empower us by your Holy Spirit to be bold and, and for Joseph to just uh, to to be able to share uh, our love for you and our hope for you uh, with those around us. So we just uh, ask your help for that, Lord, and uh, give us opportunities, Lord, for us to be able to share with others the love and the hope that we have for you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the food that has been prepared tonight, Lord God, covered with the blood of Jesus. We are thankful that this food will bring us, Lord God, to serve you more and more, Lord God, because we love you, Lord God. And bless this place, Lord God, more and more, Lord God. We call like this family, all the loved ones uh, from the Father, Mother, Pride. The uh, grandfather, grandmother, uh, the grandchildren, all are blessed because they've opened their house uh, for you, Lord God, like the Abel Adam had the glory of God. Fill this place with your glory of God. And we are thankful for food for tonight and bless others too as we enjoy the food and fellowship tonight. And your blessing, your healing, your health is increased with the increase of God. Now, I in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's time for um, uh, supper or dinner. <laughs> uh, dinner tonight, and um, thank you for praying for us, Pastor Shane and Pastor Jonathan. Uh, we are we are blessed by that prayer. Thank you, praise God. And uh, yeah, we will start the fellowship and hope everybody will have an awesome time tonight. Thank you. Right? Praise God. Thank, thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.